You are listening to the Primitive Intelligence Podcast, episode 620, Two in Half Men, Ireland's Mummified Torsos. I know, it's kind of a weird, twisted title, but today's episode will travel to the heart of Ireland, where the remarkable discovery of two mummified torsos gives us a glimpse into the Emerald Isle's Iron Age over 2,000 years ago. This will be the last episode of Season 6. I'm going to take a little time off from recording, a little break from researching, but while I'm doing that, I will be putting out those shorter bonus episodes each week, like I did with Seasons 5 and 6. So those will start with uh, bonus episode 6 and probably go to 11. I think I'm going to take five weeks. Uh, the last week of July or June and then all of July. But I put those bonus episodes up so that, you know, you know the algorithms. They like to see consistency. I have an idea what I'm going to do with them. I'm going to probably record them all in one shot and then just schedule them and put them up and then take my time off like I did last time. So I hope you guys enjoy those bonus episodes. I like doing them. I do them a little bit differently, and they're just a nice break, kind of fun stuff. So without any further ado, the Season 6 finale of the Primitive Intelligence Podcast starts now. saw a headline talking about well the second torso I'm going to talk about and when I first saw it I thought this can't be real this is Mexican alien mummies all over again and then I looked into it and found out no not only is it real but it wasn't even the first one they had found like this and it just really it kind of piqued my interest so I looked into both of them and I figured this is what I'm going to talk about today so imagine a time Over 2,000 years ago, during the Iron Age, when rituals, kingships, and ancient customs ruled the land, in this mystical era, two men met their untimely and violent ends, only to be remarkably preserved by the unique conditions of of peat bogs, which I'll get into in a minute. Their bodies, discovered millennia later, offer a rare and intimate glimpse into their lives, their deaths, and the enigmatic world they inhabited. Who were these men? What circumstances led to their brutal deaths? And what secrets can their well-preserved remains reveal about ancient Ireland? Today, we're going to explore the mysteries surrounding the clonic caveman man with his distinct hairstyle and high-status no joke, hair gel from 2,300 years ago, and the old Krogan man, known for his immense stature and well-manicured nails. Now, that's the first one I saw the story about. We'll unravel the clues etched into their skin and bones, piecing together a story that speaks of power, sacrifice, and a world long past. But first, not even off-topic, I know sometimes I get on tangents, but first we got to talk about peat bugs and what they are, how they operate, and then how they're important to this story. A peat bog is a type of wetland characterized by waterlogged conditions, acidic water, and a thick accumulation of peat, which is a dense, dark, and spongy material formed from the partially decomposed remains of dead plants, primarily sphagnum moss, which accumulate over thousands of years. These unique ecosystems are found in many parts of the world, including Northern Europe, North America, and Asia. Peat bogs are perpetually saturated with water, creating an anaerobic or low oxygen condition. This waterlogged state is crucial for a peat formation, as it slows down decomposition of organic material. The water in peat bogs is highly acidic, which further inhibits the breakdown of organic matter. This acidity is primarily due to the accumulation of sphagnum moss, which releases acids as it decomposes. Over time, 
the slow accumulation of partially decomposed plant material forms peat layers. These layers can be several meters thick, with the deepest layers being the oldest, potentially dating back thousands of years. The vegetation in peat bogs is specially adapted to the acidic and nutrient-poor conditions. Common plants include various species of sphagnum moss, sedges, and shrubs, such as heather. Trees like birch and pine can also be found on the fringes of some bogs. These bogs support a unique array of wildlife, including insects, birds, and specialized plant species. They are particularly important habitats for rare and endangered species. Here in Pennsylvania, there is a peat bog that, well, I visited years and years and years ago, and it's one of the very few areas in the state, in the Northeast, that has pitcher plants. And it's all due to its, its very acidic content of the water. And all the trees and plant life are really short. They're old, but they don't grow much. One of the most fascinating aspects of peat bogs is their ability to preserve organic materials exceptionally well. The combination of low oxygen, high acidity, and cold temperatures creates an environment where decomposition of organic matter is significantly slowed down. This includes the preservation of ancient human remains, known as bog bodies. Not my words. This is what they call them, bog bodies. As well as wooden artifacts, textiles, and other materials. Now, how are peat bogs important? Well, they're significant carbon sinks, storing vast amounts of carbon that would otherwise be released into the atmosphere. The preservation conditions in peat bogs make them valuable for archaeological sites. They can contain not only well-preserved human remains, but artifacts and even ancient landscapes, providing insight, insights into past climates, environments, and human activities. Bogs also play a crucial role in regulating water flow and maintaining water quality in their surrounding areas. They act like sponges, absorbing excess rainfall and slowly releasing it, which helps prevent flooding and maintains uh, stream flow during dry periods. Peat bogs are mysterious ancient landscapes that offer a window into both the natural world and human history. Their unique conditions not only create a haven for specific plant and animal species, but also serve as time capsules, preserving the past for future generations to study and try to understand. When I was in Ireland, we rented, I was there twice, and we rented a couple cottages. And every time we rented a cottage, there would be a small fireplace and they would burn peat. And they get them from these peat moss. Peat. They get them from these peat bogs. They're pretty cool. They must. I know they, they cut the peat out and then they dry it. There's not a lot of trees to cut in Ireland. So they use the, the peat. It's actually pretty cool. So let's get into the mystery of the Clonic Caven Man. In March 2023, in Clonic Caven, County Meath, Ireland, a discovery was made that would send ripples through the archaeological community and ignite the imagination of history enthusiasts around the world. Body of a man, dating back to the Iron Age, was unearthed from a peat bog. Known today as the Clonic Cavan Man, his remains were so well preserved that they offered a rare and intimate glimpse into the past. But this was not a man who passed away peacefully. His death was brutal, mysterious, and laden with intrigue. So who was Clonic Haven Man, and why was he murdered in such a horrific manner? What secrets does his body hold, and what can it tell us about life and death during the Iron Age? Clonic Haven Man is a prime example of what is known as a bog body. Like I said, not my phrase. These ancient remains are often discovered in peat bogs, which provide perfect conditions, as mentioned above. With the high acidic water, the low temperatures and low oxygen levels, they create an environment where skin, hair, and even internal organs can remain intact for thousands of years. Unlike the royal mummies of Egypt, these bodies give us a peek into the lives of ordinary, or perhaps not so ordinary, individuals who lived and died long ago. They're usually not prepared, like they are in Egypt, 
that they've been put in these bogs. So you find them as they went in. Klonic Caven Man was discovered by a machine harvesting peat. His remains date it back to around 2,300 years. Date it back to around 2,300 years old. Um, his remains date it to around 2,300 years old. Include his head, neck, arms, torso, and upper abdomen. Tragically, the peat harvesting machine is likely responsible for the loss of his lower body. From what remains, scientists have estimated he was between 24 and 40 years old when he died. Standing about 5 feet 2 inches tall, he had a distinctive appearance. His nose was squashed, his teeth were crooked, and the pores of his skin were still visible. Analysis of stomach contents revealed a diet rich in fruits and vegetables. One of the most striking features of Klonic Man was his hair. He sported a goatee and a mustache, and the hair on his head was styled into an elaborate fashion. The, the front was shaved, creating a higher hairline, and the rest was folded in an intricate manner resembling an ancient mohawk. The style, along with the use of an ancient hair gel made from plant oil and pine resin, these materials most likely sourced from France and Spain, suggests that he was a person of some wealth and status. Hair gel, 2,300 years ago. But why did Klonic Cave and Man meet such a violent end? Some theories suggest he might have been a king who was ceremoniously sacrificed. The injuries on his body are gruesome. Three severe blows to his head that split his skull. Three severe blows to his head that split his skull. A blow to his nose and chest. And disembowelment. And it gets worse. His nipples were also sliced off. A symbolic act indicating a failed kingship. In ancient Ireland, sucking a king's nipples was a gesture of submission, and removing them rendered a man incapable of ruling. Now, unfortunately, the preservation of the body by the bog gives us only part of the story. We have the who, the what, and the where, but the why remains elusive. Was he a failed king? a sacrificial offering, or a victim of personal vendetta, maybe in some way all three at once, the bog kept his secret pretty well, leaving us with tantalizing clues, but no definitive answers. And it's likely we'll never know. And that would be an astonishing find, and it was, just by itself. The more they unraveled this, and they, they realized what they had found, but imagine the surprise and the shock when just a couple months later, just a few miles away, this find happens again. This time they find the torso now known as the old Krogan man. One of the most remarkable archeological discoveries from Ireland's iron age he was discovered in May of 2003. So the first one was in March. Now we're in May. By workers digging a drainage ditch in a peat bog near Krogan Hill, County Offaly, in Ireland. At first, the workers thought they had uncovered a recent murder victim due to the body's remarkable state of preservation. However, further examination revealed it was an ancient body dating back to over 2,300 years ago. So, around the same time frame. After some tests were run, they found that old Krogan man was in his early 20s at the time of his death, but he stood about six and a half feet tall, which was exceptionally tall for a man of his era. That's decently tall today. 2,300 years ago, that is really tall. Only the torso and arms of the old Krogan man were recovered. His head and lower body were missing, likely due to the conditions of the bog or his initial mutilation. Like with the last bog body, the peat bog did an amazing job at preserving old Krogan man. His skin was tanned to a dark brown black color. His fingernails were well manicured, not 
very common back then, indicating high-status individual. The bog's condition had leached the calcium from his bones, leaving the skin without a supportive structure. And so he was just kind of a wrinkly, human-shaped sack. There will be links to these stories in the show notes, so if you want to go look at these pictures, go ahead. They're absolutely fascinating. They really are. Now, old Krogaban also met a violent end. He was stabbed in the chest, decapitated, and dismembered. Also, his nipples were cut off, suggesting a ritualistic aspect of his death, or, again, possibly a failed kingship. Such mutilations indicate that he may have been sacrificed in response to a crisis, such as poor harvests or bad weather, or as part of a ritual to appease deities. The discovery of numerous other bog bodies with signs of ritual killing suggests that human sacrifice was common practice amongst the Celts, amongst among the Kilt, common practice among the Celts during the Iron Age. These sacrifices were likely performed to appease gods, or to ensure good harvests. Some scholars believe that kings symbolically married a goddess of the land as part of their coronation rites. This union would grant them control over natural elements. But if crops failed, the king might be sacrificed to restore the balance. Analysis of the stomach of Old Krogan Man revealed his last meal included wheat and buttermilk, which may also have ritual significance. Today, the remains of Old Krogan Man are display, on display at the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin. The exhibit is designed to reflect his cultural and historical significance, and it provides invaluable insights into the life, death, and religious practices of Iron Age Celts. He serves as a tangible connection to Ireland's ancient past and helps modern audiences understand the complexities of prehistoric societies. I found several articles on this, on, on both these torsos, but I also found a video on YouTube discussing why bogs were so important in ancient culture. And in this video, they discussed the Krogan Hill Bog, it's a video by the Smithsonian. It's called The Unnerving Evidence of Sacrifice in These Irish Bogs. A link to this will be in the show notes. It's only uh, a little over three minutes long. Here's the gist of this video. The old Krogan man's body was found in the middle of this ancient bog, leading to questions about how he ended up there. A possible explanation lies in what are known as ancient trackways. These are a network of wetland roads crisscrossing Ireland. These trackways were impressive engineering feats consisting of oak planks laid on birch runners, which were supported by brushwood to prevent sinking. And since the bogs are so acidic, it helps keep the wood from rotting. Pretty amazing. Some trackways were up to four meters wide, large enough to accommodate wheeled carts. While many trackways served as transportation routes, others had more enigmatic purposes. Some paths extended into the bog and abruptly ended, suggesting that it wasn't an accident. Artifacts found in these areas imply these trackways led to ritual sites. Sacred effigies and other significant objects have been discovered at the ends of these paths indicating their potential use in religious practices. One such artifact is a wooden vessel from the Iron Age. It's like a small barrel or a large vase. It was filled with butter and placed in the bog as an offering to a goddess. This offering sought divine favor for good crops, cattle protection, and abundant milk and butter. The community's valuable contribution highlights the bog's spiritual significance. It's a big chunk of butter. In the video, they spoke with uh, Ned Kelly, who believed the discovery of Old Krogan Man in a bog, an environment linked with religious offerings, suggests that these areas were seen as inhabited by spirits and gods. The bog's behavior, such as sinking and rising, symbolized a portal to the underworld where the dead resided. The reddish color of the bog further indicated its connection to the spiritual realm, making it a place for contacting ancestors and deities. Now, 
these two torsos, the Klonic Caven Man and the old Krogan Man, two individuals whose lives and deaths have been preserved for millennia, they share many similarities, and but their unique differences also tell distinct stories of their time. While both men lived during the Iron Age, were both discovered in peat bogs about 35 miles from Dublin and were remarkably well preserved, the circumstances in which they died, their deaths, are different. With the Klonic Haven man's severe head trauma and blow to the nose and chest and disembowelment, possibly marking him as a failed king, an old Krogan man's deep cuts on the arms, body mutilation, both suggesting restraint and either sacrifice or punishment. They both had these indicators of wealth and status, though. The intri- intricate hairstyle and imported hair gel and the well-manicured nails. What was the importance? And did these two men, if they were kings, did they fail their people somehow? Or even perceived to have failed? Was it a, a bad summer? And the people thought, well, we didn't get many crops. Time for the kings to die. These are questions we will never really get. But looking back on the life and death of both of these men, we are reminded of the fragile nature of human existence in a myriad of ways. In a myriad of ways, lives can end. These well-preserved bodies are a silent testament to a violent past, inviting us to ponder the mysteries of our ancient ancestors. While well, of our ancient ancestors, while we may never know the full story, the discovery of these bog bodies furthers our understanding of history and the complexities of ancient human life. I can't imagine being thrown in a bog as a pleasant thing. It would appear neither of these men were alive when it happened, and perhaps they knew what was coming. It really makes you think about what happens today in our lives and how good we kind of have it. It could always be worse. And that's a wrap on season six of the Primitive Intelligence Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the season. It's been a lot of fun for me. It's been a lot of off the cuff, find the stories at the last minute, little research, a little bit different from season five where I was doing weeks of research for some of the stories. But 20 episodes need a break. So like I did between seasons five and six, like I said before, I'll put out the shorter bonus episodes to fill in the gap between seasons algorithms 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 not having any content not good i'm gonna like i said most likely take off all of july with new full-length episodes for season seven starting in august i'm already working on lining up some stuff for season seven i'm pretty excited about some of the things i've got coming up but feel free to drop me a line at podcast at primitiveintelligence.com if there's a story you'd like to hear or a topic you'd like to hear me cover and I'll see what I can do. I'm always looking for new books, new topics. It doesn't always have to be UFOs and aliens and ghosts and Bigfoot. This kind of weird history stuff fascinates me too. So I like looking into all of it. I hope you guys like listening to all of it. I want to thank you so much for joining me for this season. It's been awesome. I've gotten a lot of great feedback and comments and emails. Love hearing it. Love getting it. Keep it up. And let me know. Is there, are there any features you want to see on the podcast? Anybody you want to see interviewed? I, like I said, I've got some stuff I'm working on already, but let me know what your thoughts are. I've said this before. You know, this podcast is, you know, something I started, but I do it for you guys. So let me know your feedback. Let me know what you think, what you what you want to see. And I'll do my best to keep an open mind about it. I, I always, I try to keep in mind the motto I had for season four of think more. So I try to think more. I try to keep an open mind about everything, about the subjects I carry, about the subjects I cover, and about how I do the show. I'm always making little tweaks. So that's going to do it for me for this season. Thank you so much again. Enjoy the rest of your week. See ya.